AMD's glory days come in waves, as do Intel, so though up until very recently, it seemed like Intel had almost full control of the consumer-grade CPU market. Ryzen has added the competition in this space so desperately needed we could have a bit more if you ask me, but Ryzen provided builders with a value-based alternative that still pushes solid frame rates without running extremely hot, or requiring DDR3, or requiring beefy overclocking motherboards, or sporting PCIe 2.0. Yeah platform is that old. And we covered the viability of FX processors in our last video, which you can check out right here. But today, we'll take one last deep dive into the bulldozer and pile driver architectures and compare them with current Zen and Zen Plus offerings. Just a heads up, this one's going to be uh, just a bit technical. So let's start right away with the Bulldozer Block Diagram. Bulldozer was the code name for the first set of FX SKUs, including the FX 8150 and 6100, typically those names with a 1 in the second placeholder. Bashir or pile driver CPUs were essentially refreshes of the 32 nanometer bulldozer architecture. Internally, everything is nearly identical, though notable improvements included integer scheduling and power consumption. We'll address both families interchangeably throughout this video because the block diagrams do look nearly identical. The basic breakdown of the bulldozer architecture is is as follows. A fetcher splits requests and instructions between two decoders where control words are created, sent to the dispatch, and fed to two unique integer schedulers and a single floating point scheduler, the center block. In each integer cluster is a set of ALUs and AGUs which perform arithmetic operations and calculate addresses respectively. These are important for memory calls between the CPU and the main memory, also called system RAM, that's these guys right here. The CPU and RAM communicate via the memory bus, which is an ultra low latent highway for sending and receiving temporary calculations and instructions. It's made up of two parts, the address bus and the data bus, where the latter is in charge of transferring information to and from the CPU. The address bus tells the data bus where to find the data required by the CPU. You can see how those two kind of work hand in hand. Now back to our block diagram. Instructions not sent to the integer clusters are fed to the FPU or floating point unit. Here, numbers are approximated and expressed in scientific notation, so values requiring decimals or involving division, for example, may be sent to the FPU for processing, simply for its ability to distinguish the significand, base, and exponent. In a nutshell, the key difference between an FPU and an ALU, for example, uh, involves this decimal point. If values cannot be expressed as whole numbers, the FPU is probably involved. Now, by contrast, ALUs are intended to perform logical operations involving and, or, not, you get the point. Math may still be involved, but it won't stray very far from simple addition and subtraction. This is why so many pipelines exist within integer clusters, particularly if there are more cores and pipelines at a program's disposal, then processes can be expedited and thus parallelized. A few side points I wanna to touch on. GPUs are excellent parallel processors, thanks to their typically several thousand cores, whether they be stream processors from AMD or CUDA cores from Nvidia. Graphically driven programs are resource intensive and extremely demanding, in real time, so the GPU handles these in real time as a result. And another thing with respect to the FPU back in the good old days, basically before I was alive, <laughs> FPUs used to be add-ins that you could buy and install after the fact if you were running some seriously heavy programs. Nowadays, FPUs are almost totally integrated. So what happens with the three sets of data then? Two instructions are executed down integer paths and another on the floating point level. Where do they meet? LSU. No, not, not that LSU. This LSU, the load store unit. And the data doesn't technically meet here. That would be the core interface unit, which we'll discuss next. But in this case, the LSU literally does what its name suggests, loads and stores instructions to and from the memory. It's how the AGUs and FPUs send and retrieve data from the system memory and from the memory subsystem. So this ties back into the memory bus we discussed earlier. Just wanted to throw that out there because we were talking about memory a second ago. Now, down here toward the bottom, we have two important blocks and then we'll talk about the cache. We're still just on bulldozer architecture by the way. We haven't even touched Ryzen yet, uh, though you'll see very familiar acronyms, so we won't need to repeat ourselves too many times. So this write coalescing block basically acts as a filter for repeating write requests, easing the load on the L2 cache. The core interface unit tied just below is the network unifier, linking all important aspects of the module and allowing the ICs to communicate with the L2 cache directly. This cache reduces the latency incurred when executing certain tasks, so 
If, for example, you use a particular program quite a bit and there are certain instructions the CPU can send to the cache and you open the program, it can be expedited, it can run quicker, open quicker, run some particular program or you know line of code within that program very quickly because it's stored in cache up front. And it's extremely fast because it's already preloaded and doesn't have to run through the pipelines. System RAM does a similar thing, now that the process is comparatively much slower because the, the latency is also significantly higher Higher. On top of that, not all data that's in system RAM just bypasses the pipeline. Sometimes it has to be reprocessed. Sometimes there are instructions that haven't yet been processed that are stored in system RAM temporarily. In the case of cache, it's almost always data that's already been executed uh, and then it's kind of there temporarily for uh, repetition's sake so that you don't have to keep running the same process over and over again. Uh, it's just very expensive from a resource perspective. But anyway, this is one of the reasons why CPUs support various levels of onboard cache. And in general, the smaller it is, the faster it is. Level one cache being the fastest, again, the smallest as well. So you can't use a lot of it. All right, are you ready for Ryzen now? I know that was a lot to digest. The script took several days to write on account of all the research involved. However, I think you'll find this part of the video a bit easier to understand if a lot of this is new to you up front, just because we'll be comparing, not necessarily talking about how they work or why they work a certain way. So here we go. One of the key differences between the architectures is the lack of a split integer cluster layout in Ryzen. Bulldozer packed two unique schedulers and a single FPU in each module, and there were up to four modules in FX processors, meaning in certain cases, these CPUs could act as eight core CPUs, and in other cases, they'd act as four cores. This partly explains why certain programs, including Cinebench, initially detected chips like the 8150 as four core, eight thread units instead of eight core, eight thread units as was advertised by AMD. Bulldozer implemented what was referred to as a clustered multi-threading module, which literally implies that some aspects of the unit are sharing resources, including the FPU and including L2 cache. Needless to say, a huge shortcoming of an FX processor could be identified when the floating point pipeline was fully saturated, since there were only up to four of those per die in quote unquote eight core CPUs. Six core CPUs only had three of these. Ryzen largely avoided this issue by delegating a single integer cluster and FPU per core. This block diagram gets into a bit more detail than the last one we saw, but the key things to point out are the retire queue, the dispatcher, and the integer cluster. Ryzen CPUs boast simultaneous multi-threading, or SMT, which is a way for schedulers to prioritize and sort data through logical pipelines. It's, it's, it's basically a more efficient scheduler. We discuss hyper-threading, which is Intel's derivative in this video, right here. It's basically the same general process. You can see the rename reallocate block inside the integer cluster, which sends redundancies to the retire queue. It's a way to filter out repetitions and keep the uh, expensive loads on uh, the pipelines themselves. The same is true for the floating point unit. Inside the integer cluster, we see six unique pipelines, four ALUs, and two AGUs. We only saw two and two before in Bulldozer. The extra ALUs speed up logical operations and allow Ryzen to handle more instructions per core. They're also important for S SMT, allowing an adept scheduler to saturate pipelines with fewer skips and errors. This is one of the big reasons why Ryzen is so much more efficient per core. That's why its IPC is generally a lot higher than that of bulldozers. Another key difference between the two architectures has to do with cache. As discussed earlier, two bulldozer ICs, which are essentially cores of their own, at least according to AMD themselves, share one large chunk of L2 cache. And remember, the larger the cache, the slower it operates. Ryzen cut this size down from two megabytes down to 512 kilobytes, and that resulted in uh, a much quicker response from the cache, uh, though a trade-off there is not being able to store as much data in it. So in general, Zen levels one and two cache are roughly two times as fast uh, as the previous architectures. Again, though, with that size drop, uh, it's not really gonna play too heavily into the uh, ability for the CPU to perform everyday tasks. Another radical shift from Bulldozer is Ryzen's CCX, or core complex dependency. With each CCX, four Zen cores exist and two CCXs per die exist, allowing for up to eight cores and 16 threads per chip. CCXs are connected to each other via the Infinity Fabric, which is AMD's way of interconnecting CPUs to GPUs, as well as clusters of cores to other cores. Latencies between cores in each CCX are extremely low by comparison, while latencies between CCXs can be up to 10 times slower, depending largely on system RAM frequency 
Well, it's one of the variables involved. And this is why first gen Ryzen CPUs typically yielded higher frame rates when faster memory kits were used. Ryzen also sports AVX2 rather than AVX first introduced in Sandy Bridge and Bulldozer architectures. Things like XFR were bundled in, Precision Boost, ADX, things you probably wouldn't even know were present unless you purposely looked for them. But the options and tweaks have definitely improved the user experience and even allow us to tinker a bit more with the UAFI in question, which is a good thing all around. So I say all of that to say this very obvious statement. Ryzen was a big step in the right direction, given the technology of its time. We went from 32 nanometers down to 14 and now 12 nanometer degrees of precision in just a few short years. And a few important notes I wanna mention, Ryzen chips not ending with a G do not include IGPs, which are a totally different discussion for a different video. Bulldozer omitted onboard graphics as well. Now, if we looked at the, the block diagram of an Intel CPU, it would look a little different. I mean, the, the CPU side would look the same, but you'd also have to worry about the IGP on board as well. It's the integrated graphics processor, which means that if you have one of those, you can just plug an HDMI cable into your motherboard and run off of the chip's graphics instead of having to you know, use a discrete card like a 980 Ti or an RX 580 to actually get a picture on your monitor. So with Ryzen and Bulldozer, you couldn't do that unless you were using like a, a 785G chipset. I have 786 on the script, but I'm pretty sure it's 785 uh, or something similar uh, to be bundled with the board. It's basically a dedicated graphics driver uh, that's embedded on the board itself. It's not included in the CPU. So the rule still applies. I do hope you've enjoyed this video, by the way. I know it's a lot to take in, uh, but I appreciate you giving me the chance to explain this stuff as best I can to you uh, with the limited primary resources at my disposal. I have a lot of fun with these and I hope you are uh, willing to contribute, at least willing to be somewhat entertained or interested in, in this kind of stuff because uh, I feel like this is how the channel started and we've kind of strayed away from that because as the channel grew, a lot more people were interested in just PC builds, benchmarks, uh, but this is the heart of the channel right here and this is why the channel is called Science Studio. So for those wondering, these videos are why the name is still what it is. Leave a comment down below, click that red subscribe button if you're feeling especially special, and uh, give me a thumbs up if you like the video, if you like the content, if you're looking forward to stuff on the channel that has to do uh, with topics like these. You guys are awesome. I will catch you in the next one. This is Science Studio. Thanks for watching, and thanks for learning with us.